one of my only goals as an artist is to have work that I put out into the world that elicits an emotional response. So whether it be still photography or film, the emotional core needs to be authentic. In order to work on the wavelength that, that it needs to, to be at in order to connect with somebody, for me it needs to be emotional. Storytelling is at the core because if there's an authentic emotion there, then there's a story there. So before I even found filmmaking, I was telling stories through my photographs, and that's what led me into filmmaking. I first got into photography when I was around 21. I saw a William Eggleston exhibition at the Getty Museum, and when I saw those mundane, ordinary shoes under the dirty bed, I knew that that was for me. <laughs> there was something, there was something about William Eggleston's photography that struck me as magic. Something struck me emotionally about what was in that picture, and I didn't understand why I felt a reaction, an emotional reaction to it, because looking at it, it, it didn't make sense to me that I would feel anything from it, but I felt so much. That was my first step into the world of art. I'd never seen photography being used for anything um, but advertising and fashion before that. Finding photography at that moment in my life was an epiphany. Still photography and film are ver both very important to me in different ways. The longer I'm a filmmaker, the more separate they become. When I first approached filmmaking, I was looking at it as a series of still photographs that fit together to tell one story. And there was a moment in the middle that was the core of this story. And I would show a little bit of the before and a little bit of the after, and that was my film. But really I was approaching it as a series of stills. It blew my mind when we got into post-production and suddenly I was putting music on top of it and sound design. And once I discovered those components and all the other components that make up what a film is, I got really excited <laughs> because <laughs> it was basically every single, the way that I look at film is it's every single art medium all smashed into one medium. It's the most creative I've ever felt. It's the most exhilarating thing for me to do. And then I go back to still photography, and I'm a changed woman. <laughs> and suddenly still photography looks different to me, and I can, I can play around in photography in a way that I never thought, and it means something else to me, and I'm, and I'm using it in a different way. I think the connection between the extraordinary and the mundane is an accurate observation. I'm always very interested in combining two worlds and living right in the middle of those two worlds and leaving myself and anyone else who views the work never quite sure what they're looking at. Are they looking at something fantastical and artificial or are they looking at something very real and raw that reflects who they are? as a human. I'm very interested in how the mind can distort reality. I'm interested in what is real and what is perceived. Um, so a lot of my work does dance around these the, the world of artifice versus documentary. Um, and I, allow, I try and allow that to happen on my sets too. I'll spend weeks or months in preparation for one picture sometimes. There's really always room for chance. There's no way to, to have enough time to ever prep that because it will never be what I want it to be. That's the exhilarating thing about what I do is knowing that as much as I try and fit this all into a very controlled little box um, that I can imagine in every single detail beforehand down to the very eyelash and mole and unibrow and briefcase with what papers that man is carrying and why he put them in that briefcase and 
how long has that person owned that hat. Every little detail has a story that you can then imagine who this person is by knowing that story. But ultimately it can't be controlled because these extras or actors or friends of mine or family members, all the people that I smush together on these sets, they're, they're all their own people and they all have their own emotional baggage and they all have their own reason for being there. And once we get on set, there's a bit of chaos in the controlled environment. And ultimately that's what makes everything so good um, in its own way because it's never going to be what I wanted it to be and and when it isn't a lot of times it's better than I imagined because people do weird things and interact in strange ways and the dynamic changes depending on who's on set that day and what's going on in their lives and and then you have this mashup of documentary and fantasy. Face in the crowd the figure all alone amongst hundreds of people, a crowd of people. That's another version of how the mind can affect reality and distort reality, depending on how you're feeling emotionally and psychologically when you're in that crowd. Because one of the reasons I was interested in making Face in the Crowd at the time was because I'd been traveling a lot and I, I kept noticing that depending on the emotional state that I was in, I could perceive a crowd to be this interesting place full of individuals that each had a story to tell. Or it could be a sea of anonymous faces that could make me feel more alone amongst a crowd of people than I felt in my bedroom alone at night at the hotel. I find those, that state of feeling vulnerable really interesting in that it's something that is created first by me. It's not necessarily the environment that makes me feel vulnerable. It's me and I'm my, my own worst enemy at times, as well as my own worst critic, which is what La Grande Sortie was very much about. But on the other side of the spectrum is that you're also in charge of your power. I find it compelling to observe, but also to be observed. I, th I think that's a complicated relationship. La Grande Sortie was very much about that relationship. Um, I just discovered recently, when I right before making that, that I had a horrible anxiety around s s the stage. Being on stage, being the performer, I was doing public talks for the first time, a lot of public talks, and it was all about how the audience can can affect the performer just by being there and having those eyes on you, the sea of anonymous faces staring back at you can be terrifying and you can read into all kinds of things. Why did they look at their cell phone when they did? Why did they yawn? Why did they leave the room? Are they going to the bathroom or are they not coming back because they don't like the show? Or if you're the audience, then you can look on stage at the performer and what my La Grande Sortie was about the ballet and I. I thought it was really interesting that from an audience perspective, it's just this beautiful fantasy of perfection being created, that's a whole life of work being danced out for you on stage. Um, the body never looked so light. The makeup is perfect. The hair is always perfect. Everything, the lighting is, the sets, everything. And then the second you're no longer an audience member and you're up on stage, with the performer, you see all of the cracks in that surface. The sound of the point shoes hitting the wood floor is actually very loud and sounds like a knocking of a horror movie. The makeup gets cracked very easily. It becomes very ugly in ways. She transformed, and but the audience is at that safe distance. They can never see all of that happening. I cast from friends and family and casting companies and sometimes I'll see people on the street and ask them if they want to be involved. It's more intuitive. It's, for me, it's a lot about what makes that person unique. So if somebody looks too much like the kind of agreed upon beauty of contemporary culture, generic, then I'm usually kind of bored by that, not really interested. You won't find much of that in my crowds. I'm interested in body shapes that are different, 
noses that 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 uh, grab your attention, ears that stand out. I'm interested in different types of skin colors, tones of skin, and eyes that that make you look twice. And there's just so many things about people that are really interesting and that are underrepresented in in film and media, and for no reason. It's like a palette of of paints. It's it it all it adds a richness. Color for me is an emotional palette. So it's crucial that I have color, at least for now. I've tried many times, because I love black and white imagery so much, I've tried many times to see what one of my photographs or films would look like in black and white. And it takes away the very core emotional, like the point of doing it for me. Um, it largely depends on it being in color. Some of my favorite films are in color, like The Red Shoes and The Wizard of Oz. Paris, Texas, yeah, bold color. It's, it's technicolor for me opened up a whole other kind of experiencing emotion in film. It's visceral. There's colors that we see that just don't exist still in film, There's, that we see in life and I see them in life and they make me feel something immediately. I really like playing with scale in my work because it's, it's continuing that journey into how, uh, what is reality, what is real, and I think that's a very important question, especially right now in our culture. It's um, a question that I have about how movies are made now. Like everyone is just ex assumes the movies are mostly CG now. Everyone assumes when they're looking at social media that that person's life really isn't like that, even though it looks very real. The political climate is so full of questions about what's real and what's not. Are we, are we being told the truth? What is truth? You know, so these questions, they're not literal in my work, but they're all in there. It's layered throughout and scale plays a big part of that. Los Angeles is a city that's constantly being molded by the movies, by entertainment of all kinds, and by the people that move here to become something else. The dreamers, the people that are trying to get away from something. It's a city of play and it's a city of entertainment and illusion. The layer of glamour sitting right on the surface and the under the seedy underbelly. There's so much to Los Angeles. The ever-changing, never-changing weather. It's a very strange place to grow up and so I have no idea how, in what ways it's affected me that I wouldn't have ordinarily been affected had I grown up somewhere else. I liked the idea of playing with nostalgia. The idea of looking back, viewing the past differently probably than what it actually was. I have no idea what the 50s, 60s, and 70s were even like, but I have pictures from media and movies and old records. It's this feeling of the past being safer because we, it was already experienced. We lived through it, so it's safe. It's gotta be safe. It was better, therefore.